the purpose of Jesus was a kingdom on earth in the hearts of men. Rediscovering the kingdom will defy almost every concept you have about religion. The message of Jesus was a message of a kingdom from heaven on earth. That was the message of Jesus. Your thinking will be rearranged and your life empowered as Dr. Miles Monroe shifts the focus away from religion toward the ultimate issue, the kingdom of God. Jesus came to restore these kings who lost their kingship and their kingdom. Let us now join the seminar in progress. Here for the Institute today, and so we deal directly with the issue. Uh, we are here to be changed, to learn, to transform our thinking, and to learn things we never knew. Write this down, please. Unless you learn something new, you're not growing. Growth is always measured by change. Change always takes place when something new happens, either to you or in you. And so you can measure whether you're growing by learning something new. It's very important for us as individuals to keep growing. Second statement to write down. Truth is progressive, but not relative. I think all of us who have studied some form of philosophy know that there is a philosophy out there which teaches that truth is relative. And this is not true. But truth is progressive. The more you learn, uh, the, the more you begin to appreciate how much you don't know. And what we're going to talk about in this section, this session, is some information that will probably expose some of your ignorance and get rid of the rest of it. I hope you don't mind doing both. I want to be speaking on the characteristics of the kingdom. And uh, this session may seem to be not too critical, but I think it is probably the most important aspect of application of the concept of the kingdom that we need to study in. Basically, we're going to be talking about understanding the focus that Jesus had, why he taught so much and focused on this subject of kingdom life. And uh, let's begin with a few thoughts. Number one, Write it down, please. God's original plan was never religion. And that's a concept that we need to just clear in our minds. That's really a paradigm shift. Because we are all religious people. And I'm talking about everybody. Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Confucius, Scientologists, Baha'i faith. The Moonies, Unification Church. Yeah, there's a whole lot of religions. And I better throw in the part Christianity. Because Christianity has become just like all the others. It's one massive, complicated, ritualistic, religious experience. Religion is from the word which means to search. So religion is a is the description you give of a person participating in a search. So religion is an activity of searching. And that is why religion is so overbearing. It's, it's a search. You're trying to find something. So Christians are also being reduced to a search. That's why we're still not we. I used to be one of them. I'm no longer a Christian. <laughs> I'm now a citizen. We'll talk about that in a minute. But religion makes you strive to please your deity. Uh, religion makes you strive to appease your deity. And these are important statements I'm making because they are so subtle. We have become just like almost any other religion in the world. We do things so God could like us. That's what other religions do or are afraid to do. 
They want to appease the deity. Isn't it strange that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you? So how can you try to appease him? But yet religion does that. Christianity, the religion Christianity, is a religion of keeping laws. It's a religion of keeping expectations laid down by an organization called whatever your denomination is. That's what Christianity has become to most people. Uh, this is why Christians are always tired. They're tired working so hard to not break laws. Suppose you spend the rest of your life living in your country, focusing on not breaking any law. How could you enjoy living in that country? Citizenship is not the focus on keeping laws. If you are a citizen of your country, you enjoy your country. You enjoy the environment, you enjoy the resources, you enjoy the atmosphere, you enjoy the culture, you enjoy the food, you enjoy the, the freedom to walk on, on the park, or to go on the beach, or to go swimming, or, or to go and watch a game. I mean, you enjoy your citizenship. You don't focus on, I wonder which law I'm breaking now. Religion makes you tired. God's plan was never religion. Secondly, God's plan was for you always to rule. Always rulership is on his mind. Thirdly, your destiny is king dominion. These are concepts you need to get into your thought patterns. Fourthly, the purpose of God is Christ in Christ, rather, was to restore his kingdom on earth. That's why God sent Christ. Was to restore the kingdom on earth. And then fourthly, every man is searching for kingdom dominion. Now this statement is loaded. Every man is searching for kingdom dominion. In other words, every man is looking for power over his environment. Please write this statement down. Christianity is a religion. Religion does not give you power over your environment. Religion gives you the tolerance to endure the circumstances. Religion also gives you comfort in the midst of your tribulation, your trials. It, it, it makes you accept your environment without the prospect of changing it. But the kingdom is different. God intended for you and I to be dominators of our environment. And I want to stress this power bit. Every human being in the world is looking for power. Every human being, 6.2 billion of them, whether they live under a bridge or they live in a palace, they have the same desire. They both want power. Am I right about that? Be honest. What do you really want? Tell the truth. And don't come to me with all that religious garbage about you want to be humble and you want to you know, just serve the Lord. No, you want power. And don't be ashamed of that desire. As a matter of fact, if you don't want power, something's wrong with you. Some of y'all look shocked already. I ain't started yet. Power motivates everything you do right now. I can prove it. Power motivates you right now. Power motivates everybody. That's why there's corruption in the world. The corruption is not the problem. Corruption is activity that the individual participates in with the prospect of getting power. I want to prove it again. You want power. And we got to settle this issue because if we don't settle this, 
you're going to keep denying the truth about yourself. You want power. Why is it every young person's dream, even the man sleeping in the gutter on a cardboard box right now, his dream is to be a millionaire at 40. Why do all of us think that? Now, we don't tell everybody that, but we think that. Anybody never thought that? Don't lie. All of you dreamt of being a millionaire. Is that true? Come on, hold your hand up. If you ever dreamt that, hold your hand up, please. If you ever thought of that, hold your hand up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Obey me. Turn us up lying. Lift your hand up. I'm, I'm disappointed. Oh, three millionaire. Okay. Instead of one millionaire. Yeah. We all want a lot of money. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. We don't want money. It's not money we want. We want what money promises us. Money promises us power. Power to wear what we want, drive what we want, live where we want, eat anything we want, buy what we want, go where we want, stay as long as we want, play the sport we want. I mean, just do anything we want. We want the power. Why do you try to be famous? And don't lie. Everybody wants to be famous. Because it's not fame you want. What fame gives you is what? Influence. And influence is what? Power. So that's what you want. So you try to become a good singer, a great basketball player, a great hockey player, a great football player, a great preacher. Same issue. Why? It's not the activity. It's what it promises you. What does it promise you? Power. Do you know why you want power? Because it's natural. You know, I'm going to say this to you. I have so much to say to you, but you can't take it now. But I'll say this much. What was the last thing Christ promised you? Last promise. It's found in Acts chapter 1. He knows just what you're looking for. He promised you power. Not just power, but power over circumstances. He says, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Why? Because he knows that's what you want. It's power. Are we selling this issue yet? No, we still ain't selling. Some of y'all still ain't get it. I can see it. Power. Do you know why the poor people like Jesus and didn't like the Pharisees? Here's something crazy. Do you know why the rich people love Jesus and didn't like the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees and Sadducees represented religion. Remember now, religion doesn't give you power. It gives you toleration. <laughs> it teaches you to tolerate your circumstances that you can't control. As religion does. So religion says, it's the Lord's will for you to be like this. That's religion. So it explains why you shouldn't control your environment. But here comes this 30 year old rabbi from this little town in Nazareth. And he has a message that's not religious. He's preaching this king dominion he's preaching ruler domination come on let's say it. Don't, don't get too spiritual about the word king means ruler and dom is domination so a kingdom is a ruler that dominates he says you were born to be in a rulership dominion position. When the people heard that, they said, my God, you mean we could take control of our circumstances? So they followed him by the thousands. Why? He appealed to what their passion was. And every one of you get it. He appealed to their desire for power. And then 
He then did demonstrated it and that made it worse. Because they didn't only hear him say you're going to have power, but now he said getting rid of disease they couldn't get rid of for years. Here's a guy sick for 38 years laying on a mat. And every time he tried to get up, people run before him. I mean, the guy is what? Helpless. His circumstances controls him. And he lays on a mat. And the mat becomes his prison. Here comes Jesus. And the Bible says he preached the kingdom of God. And then he told the man, what can I do for you? And the man says, I was laying here. I tried to get up. I can't get in. And Jesus says, well, what do you want? He says, I want to be healed. He said, good. Take your mat up and start carrying your mat. Don't let your mat carry you. You all talk to me. Clap. That's a good place to clap. What did he give the man? Power. Lepers, man. When you had leprosy, you had to tie a bell around your neck or a bell around your feet. A cow bell. Just like a cow. When you were leprosy, you tie a bell around your neck. They put you outside the city. You couldn't come in. And whenever you came close to a human, you would ring the bell so they would know you are leprous. And therefore, you were literally an outcast. You were, you were, uh, you were not able to socialize with the community. So to be a leper was to be an isolationist experience. Out of the community. Christ meets these ten lepers in their own little, you know, uh, isolation little colony. And he says, you guys need to go back to your family. I can imagine them saying, but we cannot control our circumstances. So he gives them what? Power. He takes away their leprosy. Gives them power back. All right. If you don't get this right, we can keep missing the kingdom. Tell your neighbor, I want power. Say it loud. Do you know why you get ulcers, high blood pressure? You get all kinds of skin disease. Do you know why you got cysts growing in your womb? You got lumps in your breast. And you got all kinds of problems in your sexual organs, brother. Do you know why you got eye problems and, and all kinds of chest problems and your and your, your arteries messed up? Do you know why you got some attention, your neck so tight and your back aching? Do you know why you sick? You sick because you ain't got no power. Let me explain what I mean. Nothing makes you more depressed and frustrated than not being able to pay your bills. All right. Amen. The bank controls our lives. They control the car. They control the house. They control how much groceries you can buy because you got to split the salary up into payment for the house and for the food. And sometimes you got to cut down the amount of food you eat because you got to pay more than one person that you may create a bill with. And sometimes you take home stuff that don't belong to you because it belongs to somebody else. Uh -huh. You ever heard this? My paycheck gone before I received it. That's common. What does that mean? Other people control your lives. That's why you want to be a millionaire, hey? And so what do you get? You got worry. What is worry? Stress. Dr. Chris will tell you here this morning, scientifically proven, 97% of all disease is caused by stress. What is stress? Worry. What is worry? Concern about circumstances you can't change. What? Why do you think Jesus promised us Authority over sickness and disease. He says it's kingdom. The kingdom gives you power over circumstances. What? That's what you want. And it goes all the way back to your original assignment, isn't it? Genesis 126, you know it very well, huh? What does it say? And God said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. Next statement. Let him have dominion over what? Fish, birds, trees, plants, creeps. All on the earth. He says... You were created to dominate the environment. Kingdom is rulership over the environment. And whenever you cannot do that, then you become depressed, oppressed, suppressed, and compressed. And that's why he came to set us free. Power. How many of you could think of some things you want to do right now, but you can't do it because you ain't got the resources. Let me see your hands. Now, how do you feel about that thing? Frustrated, aren't you? You want to finish that church, man? That frustration is you ain't got what it takes. The resources. You got no power over the circumstances. 
Then you go to the bank and then they start dictating the terms. Now you're under two prisons. The worry, now the stress. Then if they do give you the loan, <laughs> they add interest to that and then they put a little note. This can be called in on demand. That's prison. So the Bible says the borrower is what? He's a slave. It's dominion. You were not created to be dominated like that. You created to dominate. And so the kingdom of God comes to restore that dominion. This other statement here, the destiny of king dominion, uh, is, is so important because <clears throat> power is what the kingdom promises. Now, I want to show you how the kingdom works. Very important here. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Some of you never read these before in your life, so please write these down. Matter of fact, we think that the Bible really is a deep book. The Bible is a very simple book. I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures of who the kingdom was designed for. All right? But remember now, we are reading the Old Testament. Some of you think the kingdom of God is a New Testament subject. No, it's as old as Genesis 1.26. But here we see Daniel. Daniel got a view of the future of mankind. Remember, he got the revelations about the future. And here's what Daniel saw in Daniel 7, verse 17 and 18. He says, But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, forever and ever. That's found in Daniel. You should read the whole passage, get the context, it's beautiful. He's talking about when the Messiah comes, he will create a nation of saints, and then Daniel says, the saints of the Most High God will do what? I can't hear you. Say it loud. Possess what? Not a religion. They possess the kingdom. How long? How long is forever? That means you cannot stay in heaven if that statement is true. Because there's no rulership in heaven for you. Check the Bible. No one, no human rules in heaven. There ain't no room there for you to rule. That place already under rulership. What is unruly is earth. He says, that is your destiny. The next statement I found very interesting. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Eh? One that we read last night. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from this time on and forever. When Christ comes, he says, he will bring what? A government. We didn't last night. But look, look at what it says about the government. It says, the government shall increase and it shall never stop increasing. And then it says, he will uphold his government through what? Justice and righteousness. Now, write the word uphold down. Don't, that's not a, it's not a complicated word, but you've got to know what it means. The word uphold means to maintain or to, to function by. Very important word. To uphold means to maintain or to function by. So when you put that meaning in there, the verse changes. It says, this kingdom that he will have, he shall maintain it and it shall function by two things. Justice and righteousness. Write the word justice down. The word justice is not a religious word. It's a legal word from the courts. And every time you read the Old Testament or the New Testament and you see the word kingdom mentioned, it always has a word either next to it or not too far from it, the word justice. It says, and he will rule with justice. You ever read that in the Bible? All through the Bible. He will rule with justice. Everybody say justice. justice. Say it loud. Justice. Say it loud. Justice. Write the word justice down. You got it down? The word means, ready for this? It means, <laughs> I love it. It means rights. R-I-G-H-T-F. This is important revelation. He says, this kingdom will not function on feelings. Religion deals with feelings. Religion deals with emotions. Religion makes you hucka, 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 hucka. Religion makes you fall in the spirit. And religion makes you dance. And religion makes you feel the anointing. None of that gets you anything from God. This kingdom doesn't function on feeling nor emotion. It functions on what? Rights. Why? It's a literal government. 
When you go into the courtroom, friends, to get something in the court system, and you stand there in that witness box, and the judge begins to talk about your case, and your lawyer presents your evidence, and then you begin to witness. Now, here you are in the courtroom, you ever seen this? And you begin to break down and cry. You go, but judge, do you know what the judge does? The judge stops the court. He says, stop. Uh, we will now take a break for 15 minutes. Please go and compose yourself and come back. Why? This is not a place for tears. This is a place for rights. And rights are obtained by evidence of legitimacy. Man, you all ain't listening to me. In other words, the reason why your prayers ain't answered yet, you've been praying for some things for a long time, is because you think God listened to you because you come with a funny sound. Oh, Lord. Yes. God said, look, this is a legal kingdom. you got to bring rights to me. Do you have a right to what you're asking for? It's kingdom thinking. Let me tell you something. Listen carefully. And this is going to blow some of your religious minds. An all night prayer meeting could do nothing. If you don't understand kingdom. Hanging around the courtroom all night. Does not bring the judgment in your favor. I finished my case. You can, you can stay in the front of the courtroom for three days. And in three days, the judge said, what are you doing here? You got any evidence? Any new evidence? Do you have a right to claim what you're demanding? Look at that. He says his kingdom will operate on rights and righteousness. Right the way righteousness down, very important. Why is this word always mentioned next to the kingdom? Seek the kingdom and its righteousness. Righteousness means, write it down, it means right relating. It means proper positioning. Oh man. Look at that verse. He said this kingdom will function on two things. If you are positioned properly, you can demand any rights that's yours. Right. That's the way the kingdom right. works. Right. So if you are out of position, God don't even ask for nothing. Let me tell you something. You remember when Christ says, if you come and bring your petition before the king, and while you present your petition, you remember that someone has ought against you. He said, don't try to present that. Why? You are not rightly related. I'm so excited about living, brother. Because I tapped into the secret of the kingdom. That's why Christ called it a secret. The secret of the kingdom is not your, your emotional crying, snot nose, running, moaning, altar, weeping religion. The most frustrated people on planet earth are religious people. You might be sitting next to one of them. They are frustrated. And if they are honest, they'll tell you they're frustrated. Now they put on a show for a couple hours every Sunday. But they're frustrated because the life ain't working. Your life ain't working. Why? Because religion deals with feelings. But a kingdom is a government with a legal entity. You need to go read the Bible all over again, see? There was a woman sitting in a religious organization for many years. You all, you all, you all remember this woman. She's an interesting woman. She was sick. She couldn't bend, bend up. She was bent over. She was sick for a long time. And she came every week to that synagogue. Why? Because religion makes you comfortable in your circumstances. Every week she came there, sat there. Every week. And these big, long row bishops called Pharisees and scribes Sort of the every day read the scriptures, deep stuff written by Isaiah, and made their commentary from the Torah and the Pentateuch, and they, they they were so deep. And the woman kept coming there with her sickness. One day the king came in, and they asked the king to read the scripture. That's a rough thing to do because now he ain't gonna read it. Now he's gonna demonstrate the thing. And he walks up to the podium, reads the scripture, and then the Bible says he fastened his eyes on the woman. 
the leaders began to get nervous and they said, oh my God, he going to do something. He, I know he, he going to do something. And it's the wrong day. It's the Sabbath day. He's supposed to work on this day. And the Bible says, Christ, knowing their thoughts, they might have been sip, sipping behind him, so he picked up something. He said these words. Now, he, he's about to set the woman up, all right? He said to the whole crowd and to the leaders, he said, which of you, if your ox fell into the ditch on the Sabbath day, would you not go and get him out? Of course, he saw them do it, so they couldn't answer the question. Now, in those days, an ox was like, uh, was, was like your investment. Because an ox was what the farm was built around. You lose an ox, you can't make any money. The ox was like your, your, your tractor in the farm. That's why you'd go in the ditch on the Sabbath day, get your ox. Because you, you, your, your whole company just fell into the ditch. So you got to understand the thinking here. So he said, well... This woman, and he pointed out, he said, this woman, watch this now, he's going to shift in the kingdom, thinking, is she not a daughter of Abraham? In other words, I don't care how she feel right now, I don't care how she moaning, there's nothing to do with that, nothing to do with moaning. I'm shifting into rights. Is she a daughter of Abraham? Then if she be a daughter of Abraham, watch the words he uses, ought not. Right. Now that is a heavy word. She ought to be free from this infirmity. Lift your right hand. Say it with me. I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen. I ought to be debt free. Be you know, see, you don't mean it. See, you put your hand down. Say it again. I ought. Let me tell you something. That hit me last year. And this year I'm debt free. You ain't got it yet, see. Still religious, man. I'm telling you, my friends. We ain't got it yet. It happened to me in record time. I still can't explain how it all happened. I'm debt free. I own my house. $600,000 house. Paid for. Own all my cars. Don't own nobody nothing. And the only explanation I got is kingdom. It got to get here. Lift your right hand and say, I ought to be healed. See, if you ask God for healing, you ain't going to get healing. You got to go in there understanding that I have a right to be healed. Come on, say it. I have a right to be. Say it again. I have a right to be wealthy. That's a different idea altogether. She ought to be free from this, he says. God is not supposed to bless you as a favor. That's religion, man. And I know it because I used to be in the religion. I was steeped. I was born into a, a, a pastor's family, a preacher's family. I'm a PK. I know I can write books on religion. I know how to keep religion real good. It'll kill you. Nothing is more exciting than the kingdom. 